I arrived home in really good spirits after an exciting training session, and my mood took an instant nosedive to see my devious cousin Caitlin holding my diary. Oh, wow. So your crush is Leo, the swimming club captain, huh? Give me it back. I wonder if the whole school knows yet. Don't worry. Your devoted cousin is here to help. Thanks a lot. But I'll do it myself. Stop poking your big nose in my business. Hey, um, first, your nose is much bigger than mine. And second, about Leo, Leo, whatever. He'll be mine soon. Tit for tat. Payback for stealing my boyfriend. How ridiculous. And so not true. She should blame herself for having terrible taste in men instead. No thanks. I didn't want a player like him either. Hi, I'm Megan, the leader of the school scout club. I'm friendly, fun, and love going on adventures, just like my explorer dad. So, of course, girls like Caitlin don't scare me. From day one of my dear cousin moving in with us, it was clear we were never going to get on. I love to run around the garden and learn interesting survival tricks with my dad, while Caitlin can't even stand a speck of dirt. Oh my god! Billions of germs are attacking me! Get me sanitizer! No! And it didn't help at all that Caitlin's jerk of a boyfriend asked me out right after breaking up with her. Despite my clear disinterest in him, she blamed me. That's when we were officially like Cardi B and Nicki Minaj and the prank wars began. She drew on my face in permanent marker while I slept, stuck gum in my hair, and once she even tried to shave my eyebrows. But who am I, huh? I can beat her with only one move. But now, the stakes have been raised. She's going after Leo. So I need to confess my feelings to him ASAP before Caitlin butts in and ruins it. The perfect opportunity would be the upcoming school field trip for top students, which Caitlin definitely can't join. And there'll be plenty of chances for me to impress Leo. But there's one slight problem. It's by a river. OMG, thinking of it made me want to pee my pants already. Ahem. <clears throat> I have thalassophobia, which is an intense fear of large bodies of water. Of course, I keep this a secret because no one will take me seriously as a scout leader if they find out about this. However, this is a once-in-a-lifetime deal, and no way can I just sit at home while Caitlin digs her claws into Leo. So, I signed up for the trip and set up a master plan for it. Baby steps. I mean, literally. I signed up for swimming in a kid-friendly pool. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Oh, but why are my legs trembling like this? <laughs> it's not like I've morphed into a jellyfish or something. Look, the pool is turning into the scary ocean ready to swallow me. Help! Suddenly, a boy with a floaty bumped into me. I fell on my butt and my leg touched the water. Something grabbed me. Loch Ness Monster! It's eating me alive! Just then, a kid popped up and started laughing at me. It's okay, Megan. Happy thoughts. Think happy thoughts. Ah, this is much better. But then I felt splashes everywhere. I tried to avoid them but ended up toppling over and fell into the water. Panicking, I spluttered and flailed about. I couldn't care any less about everyone looking at me weirdly anymore and just screamed for dear life. Suddenly, strong arms pulled me out of the water. Then that guy carried me and my face pressed right against his chest. Holy moly, it felt harder than a rock. You all right? Oh, my Superman. I'll be your Lois Lane. Ew, snot is streaming down your face. Disgusting. Gosh, this is so embarrassing. I got dressed at the speed of light and ran out of there. Um, hang on. Something isn't right. Hey, missing something? Jesus, this jerk still tried to embarrass me at the last minute? The only good guy in this world is my Leo. As if it's still not enough to call it a day, I came home to see Caitlin watching a scary movie about a giant shark. Sup? Scared of me already? It's not too late to cling onto my leg and beg. <laughs> Who's scared? This stupid show. It's obviously all CGI. There's no shark in the world that could be that big. <laughs> and, um, they're labeled as dangerous, indiscriminate killers that eat anything in sight. But in fact, sharks are most often the victims. Whew. My acting was not so bad, was it? Finally, the field trip participants list was published. Of course, my name was on it. And Leo, too. But wait. Why is Caitlin here? She's always wrapped up with boys instead of studying and doesn't even remember the multiplication table. What? Can't accept the fact that I'm a genius too? FYI, I am super quick at math. Really? So what is 356 plus 445? Easy. 234. Huh? That's not even close. But it was quick. See you on the trip. I'll be watching you, sis. 
The day finally came, and our tour guide is Mike, the best scout in the state. But hold on, why does this guy look familiar? Oh no, that's the guy who saved me at the pool. Scared that he'll expose me, I didn't know what to do but to give him the stupidest smile. To my surprise, he seemed not to remember me at all. Then he asked me to demonstrate the first activity with him, vertical neck climbing. It's time for me to shine. Eyes on me, Leo. Gosh, this guy climbed like a monkey. But don't expect me to accept a loss. I was enjoying the victory when Caitlin approached me. Everyone knows that muscle power is only to make up for a tiny brain. Yeah, great shout, Megan. Use all your energy up in one go just so you can show off. Are they cut from the same cloth? Never mind. Hmm, Leo's looking at me. His eyes are so dreamy. That was even more powerful than ten cans of monster drinks. Nature Hunt, Monkey Bridge, Tarzan Rope, all these challenges didn't make me break into a sweat. And Leo even came to praise me. That's incredible, Megan. How can you do that? Oh, Leo, I only had an apple for breakfast, so now I'm having hypoglycemia or something. I'm so dizzy. OMG, my dear cousin should really get an Oscar nomination for her fake act. I gave my sweetest smile and helped her. Just so when Leo wasn't looking, I tripped her up and she fell face first into a muddy puddle. Leo tried to wipe it off, but ended up turning her into a monkey. Then Mike walked past and said, Wow, this layer of makeup is a big improvement. His caddish tongue seemed not to leave anyone alone. In the afternoon, I took my free time to wander around and saw a pretty bird. Hmm, I wonder what it is. That's a red-capped mannequin. Very popular in Central American forests. Wow, good knowledge. Thanks for telling me without being asked. They have a signature dance to impress their mates. Any idea? A moonwalk that rivals Michael Jackson's. <laughs> Wait, what? Why did I laugh so hard? He might be funny, but he's still a jerk. The last activity of the day was using rocks to make fire, and I was paired with... Leo. Thank you, universe. I squidged up close to him and offered him a mint. He happily took it, but then suddenly turned red and started choking. I leaped into action and hit him hard on his back, making the mint fly out. Leo immediately took my hand. My guardian angel, where have you been all my life? Anyway, would you like to join me for a walk later? I have something to tell you. Yes! Ooh, I mean, sure. Where do you want to go? The riverbank. Romantic, right? <laughs> R river? I'll die there. But so what? This is my chance. If I die, I'll die under the title of Leo's girlfriend. Totally worth it. I arrived to see Leo already waiting. His skin was glistening beneath the setting sunlight. Hmm, he was like my very own Edward Cullen, but it didn't make me any less scared. Oh, you're here. You look pale. Are you sick? Oh, no. No, I'm fine. Great. Let's get on the boat to enjoy the view. I closed my eyes tightly and squeezed Leo's hand. Then Leo kept talking, but I couldn't hear anything until... Megan, I've admired you for so long. Will you be my girlfriend? I turned into the ripest tomato, but managed to blurt out, I I'd love to. Gotcha! Gosh, why is Caitlin here? I was still in shock when Leo jumped out of the boat and high-fived Caitlin? Then they kissed? Surprise! Surprise! Now you know how it feels to have your dream guy stolen away. No, no, please, I, I can't stand it. The water is scaring me. Just enjoy the view, Megan. Where's that fierce girl gone? Your mom told me that you have thalassophobia, but I didn't expect it to be so real. Don't worry, I'll show this to the whole school so they'll come rescue you. Good luck, cousin. Leo and Caitlin walked off holding hands. I stayed as still as I could in the unsteady boat. The world was spinning around me, but I couldn't do anything but cry. Time went by like a decade had passed. Then I felt a pat on my shoulder. Mike stretched out his hand, then swooped me up in his arms and carried me to the lawn nearby. But. How did you find me? I saw the video Caitlin just posted, then immediately went to look for you along the riverbank. Is that so? How embarrassing. He kept silent for a while, then said, You might not know this, but I used to be freaked out by heights. My acrophobia is better now, but still. No way! You nailed the climbing challenge earlier. If you want to overcome your fear, then you have to find a way to face it. Be courageous. Don't let it become a weakness for others to laugh at. Then he gave me the sweetest smile, and right at that moment, he looked kind of different to me, more attractive. 
That night, I shut myself away in my tent while the others gathered around the bonfire. I wasn't ready to face anyone just yet, and my mind was too restless to sleep. The next morning came the boat race. When I arrived, all judging eyes were on me. I was nervous, but soon plucked up my courage and spoke out. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan, and I have thalassophobia. So, I can't complete this challenge. I'm embarrassed. Not about my phobia, but about letting myself live in fear of it. I love being a scout leader with all my heart, so I'll try to beat this. Fear is not your enemy, it is your motivation. Then I walked off to cheering and clapping. Back at the tent, I saw Mike waiting for me. That's the spirit. You're really brave and have the qualities of a true adventurer. Even when you're not in the game, you've already won the special prize in my heart. Everything went smoothly after the field trip. Even Caitlin stopped bothering me. She must be busy being lovey-dovey with her new love. Until one day, I saw her arrive home sobbing. What happened? That jerk Leo, he cheated on me with two, no, three girls at the same time. Excuse me? Why is my life so miserable? I know I can never outsmart you or be as brave, as confident as you, but do I not deserve at least one nice thing? I didn't know Caitlin had this self-deprecating side. Suddenly, I felt sorry for her. She is my cousin, after all. Don't cry. I'll help you teach him a lesson. Really? Megan, I'm sorry for letting my jealousy turn me into a monster. Are we good? The next day at school, we stepped into the hallway and heard a horrified scream. It was Leo with his locker full of cockroaches. He freaked out so much that his friend had to catch him before he fell over. Oh, Leo, I am just warming up. I gathered my classmates and showed them the extra special gift I'd prepared for him. Hello, everyone. This time on Name a Cockroach After Your Ex, we have here a gentleman named Leo Whittemore. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone! Everyone burst out laughing and Leo literally fainted. And now he's known as Leo the Roach. Actually, this was all Mike's idea. So we can both retaliate against Leo and donate to the Cry Me a Cockroach Wildlife Fund. And back to me. To make things right, I decided to go back to where I started. I realized nothing is impossible when you believe in yourself and when you have a perfect companion to give you the gentle nudge you need. Hey, it's me again, Amy. Last time we spoke, I had made a huge discovery. But before we get to that, let me just remind you how we got here. My father's death left me completely devastated, so mom suddenly convinced me to travel to take my mind off of it. But instead of having a good time, I accidentally got stranded on this exotic island that's owned by a native tribe who do not like foreigners. Luckily, I met Silas, who helped me survive here, and we actually have gotten pretty close. <laughs> We're having so much fun that for a second I forgot that I had to go back, until I heard the rumor that my accident could have been staged. Would my own mother really have caused me to end up here? I needed to go home immediately to find out. And Silas was willing to help with all his might, but it's been a few days, and I haven't heard anything back from him. I waited eagerly, then impatiently for him to come. Finally, one afternoon, I heard a noise outside. I quickly went down to check. To my surprise, it wasn't Silas. It was Nora. And as usual, she looked annoyed to see me. I tried to tell her Silas wasn't here, but she pushed past me anyway and grabbed a stick to draw something. What are you doing? Abstract art? There. Island. I see. People. Then I got it. There's an island? With people? Can we get there? Yes. Can. Go. We can take a boat there? She nodded again and signaled me to follow her. Oh my god! I jumped with excitement! Maybe I was wrong about her. Nora led me to the shore, where she uncovered a small boat hidden behind a bush. Go away! Now! Go! Go! Nora pulled me towards the boat, sat me down, and started pushing the boat towards the water. Isn't it a little late to sail now? Wind! Wind faster! As we reached the edge of the tide, I realized, Wait! I need to tell Silas I'm leaving! Nora immediately became frustrated. Silas! With Dad! Danger! I didn't quite believe her, but I also didn't know if I'd get another chance like this. I couldn't imagine leaving Silas behind without a goodbye. I felt a pit in my stomach. But we will meet again someday. Definitely. Our family has all the money to rescue him later. Just hang on a bit more, hun. I'll go get help. Nora kept pushing me, and she's right. The patrol could detect me at any moment. So I started paddling away. See you again, Silas. But I only managed to go for a few feet, and then it's like my boat got stuck on something. I turned around to see... Silas? 
What do you think you're doing? Hey, Nora said that there is an inhabited island nearby, and I didn't want to miss the chance. Get off the boat. It's too dark and too dangerous to go out there by yourself. I'll go and check it out first and come back by morning to let you know if it's safe. Stay here. I was confident in his sailing ability, but it seemed Nora wasn't. She ran to cling to his arm, begging him not to go. Still, he ignored her and got on the boat. Nora glared at me before storming off, but I stayed on the shore for a moment, watching Silas disappear into the dark sea. Soon enough, the winds grew stronger and the rain started coming down hard. The storm lasted through the night. I stayed up, waiting in the cave where I spent my first night on the island. The rain stopped by dawn. I couldn't sit still and kept marching back and forth along the shore, looking for any signs of Silas. Nora returned soon after, yelling at me in her native tongue. I didn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew she was just as worried for Silas as I was. He'll be back soon, safe and sound. I trust him. And moments later, there he really was, coming back to shore. I couldn't help but run up and hug him as soon as he stepped out of the boat. I asked if he was okay and how he dealt with the rain, and Silas answered all of my questions with a tight hug, but soon we were interrupted by Nora. She shouted angrily and then stormed off. Silas chased after her and said some things that seemed to calm her down. That island is actually your family's gem mine. I've let them know that their boss lady is alive and well and ready to go home. Oh my god, really? They have their ship ready just a bit further offshore since it's dangerous to get close to the island, you know. Just sail out a little bit and they'll pick you right up. Yay! I'm finally leaving! We're finally... Silas stopped walking and looked at me sadly. Come on, let's go! I can't go with you. Nora will only let you go peacefully if I stay here. If I try to leave with you, she'll tell her father. My heart sank. We'll see each other again, I promise. How? Where there's a will, there's a way. Silas squeezed my hand and then let me go. I tried not to look back at him as I got onto the boat and set sail. I traveled for what could have been a few minutes or a few hours. I couldn't tell anymore until I was finally spotted by a larger vessel. They set out a lifeboat for me and once on board, I was well taken care of by everyone, offered food and warm clothes. But first thing first, I had to contact my family. I called home and the person on the other end was my grandmother. She's as surprised to hear my voice as me hearing hers. Turns out, after all the shenanigans that happened after my father's death, my grandma had moved into our house to take care of things and wait for my return. We cried for a good 10 minutes and then I told her not to worry. I was safe and that I'd be home soon. When I got home, Grandma, Nanny Emma, and my sister Briona rushed to greet me. As my sister hugged me tightly, I realized how much I had truly missed them, and also realized that my mom was really nowhere to be seen. No one made any mention of her in any way. I worked up the nerve to ask my grandma about her. Right when the police said there were signs of foul play in your disappearance, I already got suspicious. Then when Emma said it was your mother who suggested you go there and play those silly games, I immediately kicked her out. People are truly full of surprises. Do you really think Mom was masterminding all this? She was really trying to get both of you. Briona was lucky she forgot her passport. Don't be glum, dear. You still have me and Briona and Emma, too. We all love you and care about you very much. Now, go have some rest. It must have been a long journey for you. The next day, as soon as I got up, I went looking for my sister to confirm the things Grandma had said. When I found her, I couldn't stop the tears from spilling out. How could Mom have been the one to do this? Why would she do something like this to her own children? Amy, never listen to a story from one side only. Huh? Do you know something I don't know? Just don't jump into conclusions yet. She then excused herself to work and hurriedly left before I could ask anything else. I kept thinking about what Briona said, but couldn't come up with any other speculation. As I passed my parents' room, I noticed a box sitting outside the door. It's full of my mother's belongings. Nanny Emma is probably packing my mom's stuff out of here. Something in the box caught my eye. I opened it up and found that it was a photo album of me since I was a kid. And next to each picture is some love notes. This is definitely my mom's handwriting. My eyes landed on a photo of myself playing the piano. And my mother wrote, Sweet Pea playing my favorite song. She meant so well, but I was always the ungrateful, rebellious one. Was that why she stopped loving me? Did I do anything that terrible for her to want me gone? I suddenly missed her. I found myself taking the photo up to the piano room, some place I've never gone voluntarily. But as I reached for the doorknob, I heard voices coming from the inside. I peeked through the ajar door. Stop it. It's lucky enough that you didn't get caught. Just get out of here before it's too late. And throw all of my effort in vain? No way. My plan was going so well. How on earth could she survive? So, plan B. 
You need to secure that spot in the board of directors before Amy gets in the way, and I'll take care of the rest. But, oh god, them? They were behind all this? That night, I waited until I had everyone together to make an exciting announcement. Tomorrow, I'm officially going to start working for the company. I've been working on a proposal to pitch to the board of directors to gain their approval. That's wonderful, dear. Don't you think you need some sort of rest, sweetheart? You went through a big ordeal and... I'm ready. I'm totally fine. Well, Briona will also be returning to the company, and I'm glad I'll be able to help her out. The more hands, the better. I'm so glad you want to join the company. Later that evening, Nanny came into my room with a warm glass of milk. Oh, Emma, you always take such good care of me. Well, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and you need to get a good night's rest. Thank you. Finish your milk before it gets cold, sweetie. Good night. I hugged the warm milk glass and smiled at her as she walked out. Okay, one last revision and then I'll go prepare my outfit for tomorrow. But my eyes, so tired. Suddenly, I was woken up by a sound at the door. Then it slowly opened, followed by footsteps. Someone is walking towards me. She's looking for my documents. Aha! Time to wrap up your play, Emma. Oh, sweetie, go to sleep properly in bed. I'll, I'll help you tidy up. Cut the act, you witch. What do you think you're going to find here? My presentation for tomorrow? Joke's on you. It's a trap. But the milk, you've drank it all. You mean the glass of milk-flavored hypnotic? I've poured it down the drain. Sorry. Suddenly felt lactose intolerant. Bold of you to think you can fool me in my own house. I've seen everything. But why do you want to take me down that bad? Emma, aren't we? Because my daughter, Briona, deserves this company more than you. Before I could even process that information, Emma was rushing towards me holding a chloroform-soaked rag. Just as she backed me into a corner, the door flew open. My grandma and Briona rushed in, followed by the police, who restrained Emma right away. Briona ran over yelling, I told you I didn't want any part in your schemes. I would never, ever hurt my sister. Briona? Did you know she was your real mother already? Not until after mom was gone, then Emma told me everything. Sensing my confusion, Briona explained that Emma had a fling with our father many years ago, but he wouldn't marry her because of her lesser status. She was already pregnant with Briona at the time, so our father allowed her to stay as a nanny. When my mom married our dad, she only knew that Briona was her husband's stepchild. I'm sorry I didn't come clean sooner. I didn't know what to do, because I didn't realize how far she was willing to go. But when I saw her messing with your drink, I knew that I needed to at least warn you. Thank you for always being on my side and telling the truth now. It must have been even harder for you to process all these. But don't worry, we can still make this right. Emma was trying to explain away her crimes as the police escorted her away in handcuffs. They assured as justice would be served. We got in touch with mom, and by morning she was back home. After some more crying and apologizing and explaining and hugging, everything was as close to normal as it could be. I admitted that I didn't want the responsibility of running the company. But there was something I did want. I wanted to return to the Gem Island and oversee the exploration of the new mines. What I didn't say was the reason I really wanted to return. He was all I could think about as I embarked on my journey back to the island. We took a big boat as far as we could before I needed to board a paddle boat to remain undetected once we reached native territory. Before I knew it, the island appeared on the horizon. My heart fluttered as I paddled faster and faster, waiting for the moment I could finally see Silas again. I was so focused on the land ahead that I didn't see the huge wave coming up from behind and overturned my boat. When I opened my eyes, I once again thought I was dead. This time, it was because the first thing I saw was an angel's face. Silas. Amy. Hi. I told you we'd see each other again. <laughs> but my moment in heaven was interrupted by the tribe's return. We were surrounded by the natives hollering and pounding their spears into the ground. A man angrier and more distinctively dressed than the rest stepped forward. This must be the chief. He shouted something to the others, and they grew quiet. He shouted some more, and all of their spears were pointed at me and Silas. I looked up at Silas. His face didn't change. He hugged me even tighter. Just when I thought the end was near, I heard a familiar voice. Nora was standing in between us and her father, shouting desperately. The chief's expression softened, and after some discussion between them, the chief gave another order, which made Silas very surprised. So, yes... Thanks to Nora and all the good deeds that Silas has done for the tribe. They spared our lives, but they ordered us both to leave their territory right away. So Silas and I moved to the main island, where my family's gem mine is located. 
Here we still have the beauty and simplicity of the wild lifestyle while being connected to the rest of the world and helping manage our family business. So it's okay that we're not allowed to stay on the tribe's island. Not to mention, we still have a friend who often comes to visit. Nora had nagged her father to allow her to come over to our island every few days. It was at first because of Silas, but I think that she has set her sights on someone new now. <laughs> my precious Sunday is ruined because of my not-so-precious sister, Emma, who insisted on dragging me to church for some sister time. We walked in to see the priest rushing over. Welcome in. You must be our new member, Janet. Wh whoa whoa Just then, the holy statues nearby all fell over and shattered to pieces. It's a bad omen. She's a jinx. No, no, no! You devil! Get out of here! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Hi, my name's Janet. If you think I'm a jinx too, you're seriously wrong. Because animators, we're one that last seen. Pause it right there and... See that? That's my sister, Emma. And fast forward a bit more. Pan over, please. There. That right there is the ringmaster behind my so-called bad luck. You must be wondering why I hadn't exposed Emma that day. It's because everyone is fooled by her naive Cinderella look and never believed how a living angel could do such mischievous deeds. But the truth is, she's the devil. She did everything to make me look like a walking disaster everywhere I go. But who am I, huh? That night, to get back at Emma, I hid under the bed till she was sound asleep, wrapped my icy cold hands around her ankles, jumped out from under the bed, and BOO! Emma screamed through the roof, and our parents walked into the room worried just to see me laughing hysterically. Right then, the police on patrol also barged in, thinking something real wrong went on in our house. We ended up spending the night trying to explain to them nothing happened, and they finally left. Do you know how many sleepless nights we've had just because of you girls' petty fights? That's it. I'm signing you both up to join a community farm from tomorrow. What? But Dad, I can't live amongst animals and dirt. For once, I agree with Emma. There's no way I'm going there. You're not going back till you learn to live with each other. Living with Emma 24-7? I'd much rather be the Jinx now. So the next morning, Mom and Dad drove us to the farm to live off the land and bond together. But look at this tranquility and picturesque scenery. Maybe coming here wasn't such a bad idea after all. Suddenly, a loud obnoxious track started playing from inside my suitcase, startling the animals, and they went rogue. Stop the music! But my suitcase was locked. I caught Emma smirking, pressing her phone, and the music suddenly stopped. Once everything was under control, the farmers gave me looks of disapproval. Just when I thought things couldn't be any worse, a trailer nearby slipped off and began to roll downhill, heading straight for an oblivious farmer. Emma immediately swooped in and pushed herself and the farmer out of harm's way just in the nick of time. Richard, are you okay? Oh, yes, thanks to this young lady. You saved my life. What a good luck charm you are. That trailer has been sitting there for ages without any problems. Why did it suddenly break just now? Oh, it's my sister. She has this reputation for bringing bad luck wherever she goes. I apologize on her behalf. No, 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 no! Don't listen to her! She's evil! That's not something you should say to your sister. Look at her! What an angel! Emma immediately activated her manipulating power. Aww! Come on, we got the nicest room for you. <laughs> hey, what about me? The next morning, I was told to milk the cows while Emma didn't even have to lift a finger, just wandering around and pulling pranks on me. In a panic, a guy appeared and helped me out. What happened here? The hoses are all snipped off. I'm so sorry about that. It's my sister's stupid prank to get me to look like bad luck. Interesting. Oh well, we'll hand milk the cows until we get them replaced. Hand milk? That'd take forever. Emma's gonna have to pay. Hey, no need for that. I'll give you a hand. I'm Kai, by the way. He gave the bride a smile, and I instantly felt better. I'm Janet. Thanks for helping me, but which buttons do I push to get milk? Kai cracked up, and I felt like the dumbest thing in the world. I'm sorry, but that was so cute. Okay, you don't push any buttons. You squeeze it, like this. Just then, Sylvia walked by and saw us. Well, well, well. Who makes you smile like that, Kai? Janet, you are really something, huh? As she left, I felt my heart racing and saw Kai blushing also. Whew, it sure feels hot like summertime. So, Kai, how long have you been living here? Just recently. 
I'm actually a skier from the city too, but I came here due to some stuff. Come on, let's go sell the milk. Kai and I then made our way to the bustling market. Surprisingly, customers were eager to get their hands on our milk. I was ready to make my first hard-earned cash when suddenly, ahem, <laughs> you'd better watch out, you'd better not buy, better not drink this milk right here, Jinxie Janet's coming to town. The crowd buzzed with concern over our milk. Actually, I thought someone else was a jinx. You see, our milk is especially fresh today, all thanks to my good luck charm, Janet. She and I worked all morning to milk the cows by hand. Thanks to Kai's words, the crowd was excited again. Just like that, we sold out in just a few hours. Woohoo! But when we got home, people started praising Emma for bringing good luck to the business. Actually, it was Kai and me who milked the cows, and more thanks to Kai who did most of the heavy lifting. She has nothing to do with this. The room suddenly felt awkward and people started to look away. Only Sylvia cared to acknowledge us. I see. You two make a great team. What about us? I think we'll make a better team. Get off of me, you creep! Ouch. Feisty. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Why are you acting like such an animal, Janet? I'm alright. She may be a bit cold right now, but she'll warm up to me in no time. Right, princess? Emma immediately gave me a death stare. Aiden, why are you here? I'm here for you, brother dearest. Mom and Dad are worried sick back home. Holy cow, these two are related, but they're nothing alike. Welp, it does explain why their tension was scorching up the room. Stop it, you two. Always with the bickering. It's getting late. Janet, will you go and lock the barn door? Oh, oh yes, definitely. But before I reached the barn, a hand suddenly pulled me back. Keep your claws off of Aiden. He's mine. Oh, I see. You're smitten with him, huh? Well, too bad, because he seems to like me instead, sister. How dare you? Emma dashed ahead of me towards the barn, turned all the lights on, blew on the deafening whistle, and the sheep went wild again. I desperately tried to stop the panic herd, but no use. Only when the farmer showed up and let the shepherd dog do his job was the scene under control. This is all your fault. You'll bring us nothing but bad luck and chaos. That's not true. I was trying to help while this was Emma's doing. Stop with all the blaming and start learning some manners, will you? <laughs> I was stunned. Behind Richard, Emma grinned slightly. She won this time, but not for long. Because how about... I steal Emma's crush, a.k.a. Aiden, right in front of her. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't really have to steal anything, because Aiden always found his way to me first, and he also brought Kai along. It was like something was going on between them, and they kept fighting to get my attention. They showered me with food, fought over the seat next to me at dinner, and wouldn't let me lift anything remotely heavy. It was getting a little annoying, but seeing Emma fuming with jealousy each time is so worth it. <laughs> One afternoon, Kai and I were picking flowers in the field when he gently tucked a flower in my hair. It looks good on you. Then, he lifted my face and leaned in closer. I was floating in the summer breeze, ready for a kiss, when we both got shaken up by the engine revving. Aiden? So pretty thing. Wanna go out with a date with me? She's with me. Can't you see? Well, maybe I'm blinded. Blinded by my love for you. Um, how about you two can show some brotherly love and go together, huh? Then I walked off, only to see Emma's blonde head sticking out from the flowers. Hey Aiden, on second thought, I'd love to go with you, shall we? Driving away, I could see Emma furious, and Kai, with sad eyes following me? But the thing was, this was hella awkward. I don't feel like flirting if there was no Emma, and he, well, I don't know couldn't stand it anymore, so I told him to stop at this random clothing store and insisted he try on this fancy suit. Whoa, you cleaned up nicely, huh? Do I not look good usually? Well, you kinda look like a hooligan. <laughs> Is that genuine joy I see on your face? What? I'm always smiling. Oh really? You and Kai were ready to bite each other's heads off just then. You don't know everything about us, Janet. I know you have a thing for him, but I can never let you two be together. Not this time. We came back to the farm to see Emma waiting for us, all agitated. You tramp! Isn't Kai enough for you? Now you're playing the double game with Aiden? And you're just jealous because Aiden doesn't like you. That's right. I only have eyes for Janet. She and Kai were never together, so quit sticking your nose into our business. Emma couldn't utter a word. For the first time, she seemed so vulnerable, then rushed away in tears. Look what you did, brother. Playing with both Emma's and Janet's hearts is a low blow. You're one to talk. Wasn't the thing with Tina your low blow? Tina? Tina who? Tina was your crush. I had nothing to do with her. 
It's about time you get over that. That's not what Tina said. She told me you flirted with her, and you abandoned her when she's falling for you. She lied, okay? She wanted to use you against me, and never once reciprocated her obsessive behaviors. I just want to leave everything behind and enjoy my life here, with her. So Aiden, please, just let us be. Too bad. She seems to like me instead. <laughs> Can't you see? She doesn't care if her sister likes me. She still chose me over you. Dang, those words hit me hard. I didn't realize what I'd done to Emma all along. <sighs> it's time to end all these silly sibling conflicts. Guys, stop. Can't you see you're hurting each other just like Emma and I? Janet, this jerk plays with you and Emma. He deserves a fist or two. No, Kai. I'm not exactly innocent either. I was also using Aiden to get back at Emma. You what? I know, I know. But all these petty revenge doesn't bring us any good. No one wins at all. And honestly, I regretted having hurt Emma. And so should you guys. <laughs> you want this golden boy to drop his sky-high ego? Yeah, good luck with that. I'm not a golden boy, Aiden. <laughs> Are you kidding me? With all your success and skiing trophies, mom and dad can even see me behind all that. When you left home, they freaked out and made me go looking for you. Do you know the reason I quit skiing and left home? Because mom and dad wouldn't stop pressuring me. It's suffocating. Every time I stand on the rink, my whole body shakes like crazy. I'm not perfect, Aiden. And I did not want to take away any attention from you. I'm sorry if you ever feel that way. Well, I didn't know. You could have told us what you'd gone through. To who? To mom and dad? The ones who keep pushing and nagging? Sorry I wasn't there for you. Heck, I was the worst. Right? You two could work this out. Now if you excuse me, I have my own sibling conflict to resolve. I was about to leave when we heard Emma screaming. Fire! Fire! Help! We immediately rushed to her, and the fire already caught on the haystack. It was spreading fast. I... I accidentally knocked over the oil lamp. What do we do now? You go call the firefighter. Aiden, you go get everyone here. Us two, we will go get water. Go, go, go! Kai and I tried our best to pour bucket after bucket of water, but it only stopped the fire from spreading, not put it out. We almost exhausted ourselves when the farmers arrived along with the firefighter. And luckily, after half an hour, everything was under control. Phew! But then, the farmers started surrounding me. It was because of you, isn't it? Every time incidents happen, you're always on the scene. Coincident? I think not. There we go again. But this time, I'm too beat up to even say anything. Then, there was Emma, petrified in fear, so I used every last effort to stand up. That's right, I knocked over the oil lamp and caused this fire. What are you doing? It's okay, I'm used to this. No, it was my fault. Janet's just trying to take the fall. In fact, this whole time, I was the one doing all the damage and blaming it on Janet. Was this for real? Emma standing up for me? You! Is this some kind of childish joke? You could have really harmed everyone here. This is our life work, not your girls' playground. I... I'm truly sorry. That's it. Tomorrow morning, you'll have to leave here for good. Both of you. We had no choice but to call our parents to pick us up. Meanwhile, I gotta pack my stuff. Hey... I know I've been mean to you since forever, so why did you still take the blame for me? I'm just tired of petty fights. Besides, I feel bad for stealing Aiden away from you. I don't have any feelings for him, and I don't think he falls for me either. I just wanted to mess with you. I figured. Um, I actually heard what you guys were talking about before, and it hit me hard. You know, I used to enjoy being the only child. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, when you came... It felt like all the attention and love was stripped away from me. I felt so lonely and jealous, so I decided to make you the center of attention, but in the worst way possible. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all in the past now. I just want us to get along. And me not be called a jinx anymore. You got it. The next morning, our parents arrived all angry. We were so ready for a long-term grounding. But once they saw us holding hands, they were pleased. Honey, I think your plan worked. I knew it. You two can be little troublemakers, but deep down you still love each other. Come on, let's go home. Can we just wait for a few minutes? I don't want to leave without saying goodbye to Kai. But what took him so long? I gotta get going. Then Kai finally showed up. Wait up! I rushed out of the car and ran to give him a big hug. I thought you wouldn't come to say goodbye. How could I not? Especially when you forget the most important thing. Really? What is it? It's me, you silly. Oh, you're coming back to the city? Yes, I have a reason to be back now. To the city, to skiing, and what is it? It's you. Suddenly, a tree fell over right beside us and crashed the mailbox, causing all of the mail to fly out. Huh, <laughs> you really are bad luck, aren't you? Hey, that tree was already rotten. And don't you think that it barely missing us means I'm good luck? I'm just kidding. Just another beautiful Sunday.
I was bragging to Nanny Emma about my wonderful adventure. Goodness, that's incredible. Weren't you scared? Of course not. Dad taught me. Why are you still here, Amy? Get ready for your piano lesson! Oh, it's Mom. Again. She rushed in, snatched the phone out of my hand, said, Go now or I'll delete all these videos. Okay, just delete them. Nothing you do could ever make me care more about those noise-making logs. Then I left to my room. Always ballet and piano and violin. What kind of mother forces her kid to do things they don't like? Ugh, I won't back down this time. I have my videos all backed up online anyway. She can't control me. What? Huh? What else? I turn around to see Mom drop to her knees. No, no, it can't be. Just this morning, my husband was still... Dad had suffered a stroke on a trip to survey a gem mine, and they couldn't reach the hospital in time to save him. How could that be? He's not only my dad, he's my bestest friend. I bet the news is just as hard to deal with for my sister Briona, as she was always the one who went on business expeditions with him. He's the best dad we could ever ask for. But he's gone, and it felt like Emma and Briona were the only people who really loved me now. Just last week, Dad was sitting here, next to me. Darling, it's not good for you to just sit home and wallow. Why don't you get out of here for a few days? And go where? Next week, your sister is going on a trip to a new mine. You can tag along. I'm sure she'd enjoy the company. I don't know. I don't like business trips. I'll bet you can make time for some adventures while you're there. There's bound to be hiking and things you like to do. Since when does mom support any of my hobbies? She really must not want me around, huh? If that's what she wants. Okay then, sure. We were already running late for our flight when Briona realized she had forgotten her passport. I offered to stay with her, but she insisted that at least one of us should make the flight. She assured me she'd be back in time for the next flight and we'd see each other soon, so I hugged her goodbye and headed toward the gate. While waiting for Brianna to arrive, I've already booked myself a skydiving session, as recommended by the hotel's receptionist. This thing is right up my alley, but the weather doesn't look too good. Are you sure this is normal? 100%. That's what makes it special here. People come from all over just for these winds. This is what you call extreme sports, isn't it? Yeah, right. Bring it on. So on the count of three, I was free-falling. It was an unrivaled exhilaration. The ultimate thrill! Until I deployed my parachute. Instead of gently floating to the ground, I was carried away by gust after gust of wind. Then I blacked out. I slowly opened my eyes. What has happened? Am I in heaven now? I look around to see nothing but a beach, framed by a dense forest. This place was clearly deserted. Maybe not so deserted. There I saw a group of tribal people, dressed in strange clothes, wielding spears, I tried to move closer to get a better look, but game over. They all turned to my direction. I ducked down immediately, but their footsteps grew louder. I held my breath, wishing for a miracle. Oh no, this is definitely my end. But unexpectedly, the hand pushed me down further into the bushes, as if they were trying to hide me. I looked up and saw it was a man talking to the other in a native language. The talking stopped. Seemed like the rest had left. Thank you. Thank you so much, handsome mister. Sorry for bothering you. I'm gonna get going now. I may have let you off, but the others won't. These people are aggressive and will attack any intruder. Oh, he can speak English? Nice. I'm safe now. As I followed him through the forest, he stayed quiet, but I couldn't help brimming with questions. Where did you come from? Why are you here? You're not a local, right? Are you a scientist? Can you at least tell me your name? Silas. Okay, Silas. May I borrow your phone to call my sister? She'll pick me right up. Do you think I'd be here if I had a phone? I also got here by an accident a couple of years ago. Living like one of them is the only way to survive around here. At least until someone comes to save us. No, no, that can't be. It wasn't a deserted island, but I was certainly deserted on it. We arrived at a cave on the other side of the island where, according to Silas, the locals never roam around. You'll be safe here. I'll be right back. I didn't need him to take care of me. He may have stayed here for years, but I won't. I'll escape. It wouldn't be so hard to build a raft, right? So I gathered some logs. You hungry? 
Silas came back and threw something wrapped in leaves. Ah! Get these gross bugs away from me! I would rather starve! <laughs> these are a delicacy! You have no taste. Stay here. Don't do anything stupid. It's getting dark, so I had no choice but to go to sleep hungry in the stuffy, mucky cave. There's dirty moss and bugs everywhere! Ew! At the break of dawn, I couldn't stand it any longer. I got up to continue working on my raft. Ta-da! Easy peasy. Now goodbye, stupid island! But no! My beautiful raft crumbled and sank as soon as it touched the water. Feeling defeated, I laid on the sand in frustration. Suddenly, I heard a whistle. Hmm? Silas? How am I supposed to get up there? Am I his pet or something? What gives? Making me walk all the way up here? Mind you, I haven't eaten in a day. Then let's go get breakfast. But get changed first. He then took me to a river and showed me how to catch fishes. What do you mean I'm supposed to get my breakfast with this stick? Watch and learn, princess. Then Silas jabbed the spear into the water again and again until it's full of fishes. Okay, wanna challenge me? Psst, that's easy. Only, it's not. It's like the fishes could read my mind. It's been like half an hour and still nothing. There's plenty of fish in the sea. But somehow you can't catch any. Don't expect anything from my batch. Whatever. I'm not hungry. I don't need him. My sister will surely come and get me out of here on our private chopper soon. But Silas was really rubbing it in, grilling fish in front of me until the delicious smell filled my nose. But no way I'd give in to this. This is your best bet. Unless you want to try grilled rat or cicada or... Fine, gimme. <laughs> when we first met, I thought you were cute. But after seeing this... Ugh, this smug Tarzan. Full now? <laughs> then it's time for work. Work? So you're only keeping me around to be your slave? Do you want to keep living in that cave? You shouldn't steal the bugs home like that. We continued to walk deeper into the jungle, until we reached this huge tree. We should build you a shelter up there. You'll be safe from the wildlife, and the natives don't go to this area. Does it need to be up so high? If they are that dangerous, how come you survive here this long? Are you playing me? <sighs> I got really lucky. I was swept away by a storm while sailing alone. And when I washed up here, the natives were so ready to, you know, send me to God. But thankfully, the chief's daughter, Nora, desperately begged her father to let me live. And for some reason, he did. That wouldn't happen to just anyone. Oh, this Nora girl must have been caught in some love at first sight. That's why you stayed here all this time. So romantic. Stop wasting time. Let's get to work. Building a shelter proved to be more difficult than expected. And Silas proved to be quite bossy. Hand me the big branch. Bigger. Amy. Rattan rope. Give me another knife. Just wait a second. Let me catch my breath. You were so determined a few minutes ago. Go take a break. I want to finish this before sunset. I sat there, watching Silas work as the afternoon turned to dusk. And I must have dozed off for a while, as when I woke up, the treehouse was done. To be honest, it was better than what I expected from him. But where is he? I looked around, but the only thing I found was his scribbles on the ground. Stay here. I was glad to have my own shelter, but there was nothing to do to pass the time. Suddenly, there was a sound. Must be coming from the tribe. I followed the direction of the sound, hoping not to get lost. But soon enough, I found a clearing, where a group of the natives were gathered around a huge bonfire. They were chanting something. Others were dancing, others cheered. It looked like they were having fun, which hit me with a wave of homesickness. For a moment, I was so lost in their celebration that I forgot I was being stealthy. Uh-oh, not again. I could have tried to run, but I froze. Thankfully, Silas stepped forward, telling the others to stay. As he approached, we made eye contact briefly before he signaled people that the coast was clear, then gave me a quick wink before returning to the fire. Shortly after I returned home, Silas did too. Are you trying to get yourself killed? I'm not kidding when I say it will be very bad if they find out about you. I'm sorry. I'm just scared and lonely. I'm all by myself and my family must be looking for me everywhere. To my surprise, Silas came over to comfort me. Everything's gonna be alright. I got you. Who? Where? How are you here? She clearly didn't know much English but her weapon pointed at me was enough to know that she was angry. Silas immediately ran over to calm her down. I didn't know what they were saying, but she left, though not before giving me one last dirty look. Turned out it was Nora. Oh, what a relief! An acquaintance! Why didn't you tell me earlier? 
Don't celebrate too soon. Nora insisted you leave immediately. Oh, she knows how? Then I don't have much of a choice whether I stay or leave here, do I? Don't worry. I'll take care of Nora. And he must have, because the days passed by and the natives never came to drive me out. Silas continued to visit me every day, bringing cloves, teaching me how to pick fruit, swing on branches. Soon the work turned to play. He started teaching me tribal dances and vocabulary, and we visited the waterfalls and lakes around the island. It's pretty fun. It felt like going on adventures with my dad again. Confident in my knowledge of the island, I started to venture out on my own. But Silas didn't prepare me for this. A leopard showed itself and slowly moved towards me. I tried to stay composed to find a way to escape, even though every bit of me was freaking out. When suddenly, Nora jumped down from nowhere and petted the leopard as if it was her little kitten. She gave it a fish and the kitty just happily ran away. Thank you so much. I'm Amy, Silas's friend. Silas, mine. Yes, he's all yours. I hate him so much. I wouldn't even touch a strand of his hair. Silas? Ew. No, no. Nora huffs loudly before leaving. Here. Or maybe I shouldn't share it with you since you hate me so much. Oh, stop it. My life was on the line. It was not time to confess my feelings. Oops, what did I just say? I continued to stutter, making lame excuses. You're not even listening to me, are you? You haven't heard a thing I've said. Huh? What did you say? He grinned and left without another word. I couldn't stop smiling at the silly bracelet. The island isn't really that bad. I have the freedom I've always wanted. I wake up with the sunrise and have things like this. This really is the life. One day, the sun had already set and Silas still hadn't come over. I was starting to worry when he arrived with, Nora? Silas said she wanted to bring me some clothes. I was relieved that she finally wanted to make peace, but her expression confused me. When I thanked her, she didn't say a thing or even smile. We sat around the fire. Silas and I talked about one thing after another. Oops, we might have forgotten about Nora, but the language barrier really is a big deal, you know. And so she just sat there sulking. Suddenly, she stood up, causing hot coal to splatter all over me. Silas hastily helped me clean my hands as Nora stormed off. Is she okay? Maybe you should go follow her. But Silas reassured me she'd be fine and went to find aloe vera sap for my burns. I think she misinterprets our relationship. Does she? Because I too thought there was something going on. I was too surprised, but managed to gather myself enough to reply clumsily. Says who? I don't think you've formally courted me, sir. Tomorrow will be our first date then. In the mushroom forest. What do you say? I was glad Silas had saved this place for a date, because everything about it was curious and beautiful. Before long, I had wandered far ahead of Silas. I knew I had gone too far, but something drew me deeper into the forest. I walked along this cave, as I thought I saw a ray of light at the end. And there really was! The cave was not a dead end, but it was just covered by vines! And, oh my god, this is like a whole nother paradise that hasn't been discovered! And there was wreckage of an old helicopter! I immediately called Silas over, and he seemed to not have any idea about this either. We explored the helicopter the whole morning, but it was nothing except a rusted hunk of junk. We were about to leave when Silas hit a button and the radio came to life. We had found our new hobby. Since then, we went there every day, listening to music and pre-recorded content on the stereo. But eventually, we somehow got a faint radio signal. And for the first time, we had some connection to the outside world. I normally didn't care so much for news, but my interest was piqued by a familiar sounding story. Right after the death of the biggest name in the gem industry, his wife was kicked out of the house. Any relations to the missing of the youngest daughter? Who will be the winner of the fight for his inheritance? Was this real? Were they talking about my family on the radio? Why would my mother leave? I then recalled my mother's strange behavior before I left. She, for the first time, encouraged me to go on an adventure. And I somehow ended up here. Was it even a coincidence? Oh no, how could a mother do this to her own daughter? Calm down. I believe there's more to this. Don't jump to conclusion yet. Personally, I don't think tigers eat their young. Maybe, maybe not. There's only one way to find out. I need to go home. Immediately. I was walking down the hallway to see the infamous dude standing there, doing his old trick to pick on some shy student. Get that filthy hand off him now! Then I grabbed him and threw him away like a piece of paper. Ah, that's better.
Konnichiwa, I'm Yukiko from Japan, the daughter of Fuji, a famous martial arts master and the principal of a karate school. As his only child, it's up to me to evolve my warrior spirit and protect the weak from any baka. And this shy girl is Chiharu, the one I saved from a fight with the rival school gang. And ever since then, we became besties. Well, that's also how I earned the nickname Big Boss. I don't really care about it, but it does have some perks. I always had the best reserved seat next to the window, a desk drawer full of snacks, and on top of that, the kid was competing every day to do my homework. However, it also caused me some complications. I seem to have caught the eye of Jun, that rival school's gang leader. He bought me flowers and sent me these cheesy cupcakes every day, but I only gave him a no. Hey, he comes again. If I was your boyfriend, never let you go. Keep you on my arm, girl. You keep go, never be alone. Tomato, tomato, throwing tomatoes. Even when the guard came carrying him away, he was still shouting. You Kiko died, Scooter! Gosh, he's such a bug. Later, I came into the classroom and found everyone was going cuckoo over something. How noisy. That's the new student. He's just so handsome. As if you could tell someone's handsome from the back. But when he turned around, my eyes almost bulged from their sockets. It's Akira. Back when we were little, I adored Akira from the moment I first saw him. To me, he was even cuter than my favorite Mochi Shiba plushie. So I followed him everywhere and gave him all the candies I had. But he didn't like it that much. Why did you give her my candies? I like Akira. If you take him from me, I'll punch you. Hey, martial arts is not about fighting nonsense. You fierce kid, I hate you. After a while, Akira's family moved away and I'd completely lost contact with him. And now he's back. Our eyes met, but he looked so cold and turned away. He didn't recognize me? Fine, it was so embarrassing facing him again anyway. So I decided to avoid him like the plague since then. And just like that, with his excellent academic ability, Akira soon fell into place as the top student, while I'm a bit different. I may have been a black belt in the karate, but exams were definitely not my thing. Congratulations, you've excelled at coming last again. So, Yukiko, I've appointed another student to tutor you. Please don't say his name, please don't say his name, please, please, please. Akira, I nearly died on the spot. Can anybody throw me to Mars, please? Man, it's super awkward. I kept looking at the ground when he blurted out, Hi, Yukiko. Long time no see. So, he does remember me? During the lesson, I couldn't focus, and my body was heating up. I kept my mouth shut while he was immersed in his lecture. If there's anything you don't understand, feel free to ask. I plucked up my courage and said, Why didn't you like me when we were kids? You're still acting like before. <laughs> I'm trying to teach you, but your head's stuck in the clouds. Focus. He didn't say he hated me, did he? My heart fluttered again. Guess I'd have to try harder to get his attention then. But things didn't exactly go as planned. During the lessons with Akira, my phone rang constantly with calls and messages. Seemed like my goons were in trouble and they needed my help. I tried my best to ignore it, but finally gave in. I've got something to do. I'll be right back. Hey, those morons. They're always messing around, then leave it to me. Problem solved. Only that, lucky for you, I got there in time. In time to cause more trouble, I'd have eaten them for breakfast without you. Back at school, I saw Akira standing at the gate with a clearly not happy face. Akira, it's not like what you think. I- You find it hard to study, but fighting seems to come naturally to you, huh? Who the freak are you? How dare you talk to my girl like that? Akira, I fight to help people. It's not nonsense. Help? I suppose brainless people only know how to talk with their fists. June immediately lunged at Akira, raising his fists at him. I had to hold him back right away and told him to go. The silence went on for some minutes, but when he was about to leave, I couldn't stand it anymore. Just because I liked you then, you think you have the right to look down on me? What? Hear this. I do like you, but it doesn't mean I will like you forever. I don't care, but I'm sorry if the truth I spoke made you feel that I looked down on you. And you know what? If you can't take my tutoring seriously, then we're done. Fine, go! See if I care. I, the big boss myself, have my own limits and cannot be chasing him all the time. But I couldn't deny that a pit was dropping to the bottom of my stomach. I just want to go home and curl up under cover. Then I arrived at my family's karate academy to see it was all sealed off. And my dad was sitting on the doorstep holding a letter. Dad? What happened? Yukiko, I'm bankrupt. I had no choice but to sell the academy to moneylenders. I've lost everything. No! This academy is our family legacy. My dad's life's work. We couldn't lose it. 
So I followed the address on the letter, but there I met an unexpected person. June! Turns out, his dad is my dad's creditor. All or nothing, I decided to get straight to the point to him. What do my family have to do to get our martial arts school back? June came over and whispered something in his ear. Then he pondered a while and said, My son kept goofing around. Change him and the martial arts school is back to yours. But how? I want you to get engaged to my son. Are you serious? You think I'm a joke? Then I immediately stood up and left. That was insane. Hey, why are you behaving like that? You're still asking why? It's down to that dude, isn't it? He's just some preppy know-it-all who doesn't even like you. You, you know nothing. He also likes me, I think. Is that so? Then prove it. Make Akira fall in love with you within two weeks, and I'll convince my father to extend the deadline by three months. Fail, and we get engaged. I'm the one who is always by your side. No way I agree with your stupid deal. Go ahead, refuse. The martial arts school will be permanently closed tomorrow. Wait, I, I, okay, I'm in. Lucky enough, I had Chiharu, the love guru, to help me cook up the perfect Get Akira scheme. Though she'd been single, like, forever. <laughs> Firstly, I told my gang that Akira'd soon to be my BF, and also their boss, so he deserved a special treat. Wherever he went, other students bowed 90 degrees to greet him. They tended to his every need, carried his bag, and were always at his service. But he seemed not so comfortable about this. Ask your goons to stop their nonsense. Okay, as long as you agree to my conditions. What? Tutor me again. Oh, and have lunch together. And walk to and from school? I... I can't. Okay then, guys! Fine! Secondly, you needed to find out what Akira like, but he'll refuse to answer my questions for sure. My fake council survey will answer that. Then she handed out the paper to the whole class. My goofy Chiharu did get it done this time. Okay, according to a philosopher, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Akira's most favorite food is beef, so I rummaged through all the local supermarkets to find A5 Wagyu beef and prepared this perfect meal for him. Akira, eat this. Oh, thank you, Cream Puff. How come you know I like beef? How did you get in here? I know you miss me, so I come to visit. Before I could say anything, Akira shook his head and walked off. Okay, the first step is always the hardest. Next, seeing that Akira liked horror movies, I lied to him that Chiharu stood me up, so I had an extra ticket. It's insidious. How could he refuse? But as soon as we sat down, a familiar face caught my attention. June? Stop messing with me, you child! Eh? I'm a horror fan, just like you. We're sure a match made in heaven. I tried to ignore him and focus on my plan. This was the third time I watched this, so I knew exactly when there'd be a jump scare. It's time. I pasted a whining look on my face and was about to lean on Akira when June suddenly screamed his lungs out and jumped at me. It was not until he fell asleep that we had a bit of privacy, but from then till we left, Akira didn't speak a word and even asked to leave early. That's not okay. If things kept going this way, the whole plan would definitely fail, and it means I'd have to get engaged to June. No! The next day, I wasn't in the mood for dealing with my friends, so I lingered back in the classroom and read through Akira's notes. Oh, what's this? So, he does care about me. I can see one ray of hope. Akira, I want to improve my studies. Help me? Oh, okay. I was waiting outside for Akira to get us some bubble teas before we started, when suddenly this thief darted out and snatched this old lady's bag. I dove in there to help, but he knocked me to the ground and ran away. Here you go. You're already fighting again? Don't you have anything better to do? I'm not fi- Forget it anyway. This brave young lady helped me. W what? Say no more. I'm a bad person no matter what. Then I stormed off without looking back. I was so stupid to catch feels with that insensitive one. Then my knee suddenly collapsed. Right then, a hand reached out and gently wrapped a bandage around my knee. Leave me alone. Get on my back. Shut up. Come on. I couldn't help but smile through my frown, and my heart did a cartwheel. I clambered onto his back and looped my arms around his neck. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you- It's okay. Are you dumb? An injured leg is not enough? It's nothing. And- you don't have to carry me like this. Am I heavy? What? <laughs> if I say yes, will you jump off? No way.
After that day, Akira changed towards me. He joined me for lunch and even gave me a cute cupcake and agreed to go to Cat Cafe with me, even though he's allergic. And the classes went so smoothly. He was sweet like a lollipop and answered to all my silly questions. One time, I even accidentally saw him putting a lot of bandages in my locker. Aww. Winning the bet didn't seem so impossible then, but suddenly a girl approached him. It was Amaya, the school's popular girl. They chewed the fat. Then she leaned closer and whispered something to him. His face suddenly turned cold. Then he walked away. I was about to go after him when my phone beeped. Can't tutor you today. I have a play audition. So, turns out Akira and Amaya were both in this play. Fine, if Akira's Romeo, then I must be Juliet. I made it to the final round with my big boss energy, which meant I got to act out a scene with Akira to see who got the female lead between me and Amaya. Oh dear, look at them, being all clingy for what? That snake was all over my poor Akira like a rash. Ugh, if Chiharu hadn't constantly held me back, I'd have jumped there and given her a piece of my mind. And now, it's time for me to shine. But why is Akira's face darkened? It's okay, maybe he's trying to be professional? My bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love... My love, as adoring as, as a puppy dog's nose. Um, yes, so I may have forgotten the words, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> he may pick me for my quick thinking, and... I choose Amaya, miss. Hey, why did you pick her? You shouldn't ask me. Ask yourself instead. Then he left with Amaya without glancing at me. But today is the end of the two-week deadline. I thought you'd have some feelings for me, too. It was pouring rain. I trudged home. All collapsed, tears and rain falling down all over my face. It was all over. The bed I play, the boy I love. I should have known better that it was me onto a loser right from the outset. Through my teary eyes, I saw June running towards me. Yukiko, what's wrong? Tell me. I, I lost. What? The bet. Between us. I lost it. I was wrong about everything. Who cares about the bet? You might get a cold, you know. Get inside. But why you're here? I don't care if you think it's too late. I'm telling you anyway. I know that I'm not perfect like him. I do say the wrong thing. I forget all the time, but I... I can protect and will never hurt you. So will you... marry me? My head was spinning, and in a moment of weakness, I said yes. At least I can save my dad's school and be with the right person who truly cares about me, instead of chasing some jerk who thought so low of me. I confided in Chiharu and my family about this, but kept it a secret from everyone else. <sighs> my father didn't approve it at first, but seeing my determination, he reluctantly agreed. It was our fitting day. I was with June discussing our wedding, but he seemed distracted and kept checking his phone. Then he said he had to take a call and hurried out. Sensing something was up, I followed him. Huh? Why is he talking to Amaya? You have to thank me for your new fiancé. I told Akira about your bet. Um? Excellent job, as promised. It's not about the money. It's about making Akira mine. I don't get why both you and my beautiful Yukiko like that dude so much. Anyway, Yukiko's waiting for me. Gotta go. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. What the heck are you doing here? So it's you who made up everything the whole time? No, Yukiko. Let me explain. I trusted you, Jun. But look what you've done. You know what? You win. Do your worst. I don't care anymore. Then I ran home as fast as I could. Why do boys all fool me around like that? Right when I felt more disheartened than ever... I met the one that I didn't want to see the most. What was Akira doing here? Yukiko, let's talk. We have nothing to talk about. Chiharu told me what you're doing. You can't marry June. You liked me, so you mustn't fall for another one that easily. What? So you're the commander of my feelings now? Aren't you with Amaya? I'm not, and I never did. Listen, I was so angry to find out I was just part of your bet with June, so I ignored you. But then Chiharu told me why you did it and made me understand. So what? Anyway, you never liked me. I'm not gentle and too fierce, as you said before. Don't try to pity me. I don't. It's that I do like you. At first, I thought you were the type of person who'd use violence to solve any problem. But the more I got to know you, the more I learned about your pure heart. I shouldn't have judged you so quickly. I'm sorry. What just happened? I might be dreaming? But no, Akira, my seven-year crush, just confessed his love with me. So, Akira and I got together. June was furious about it, but he kept his word, and now my dad has three months to pay off his debt. I'm helping him out by teaching karate classes to earn money, something I really enjoy. Everything was great, too great, until... Yukiko, I gotta tell you something. I... I have to go abroad to study. I'll leave. Tomorrow. What? I don't understand. Why so sudden? I prepared for it months ago, but I couldn't tell you. 
I didn't want to make you sad. Will you wait for me? Of course not. I may get bored and start liking another by that time. It's time. I stood still watching the train pass by until I noticed Akira's melancholy smile. I liked you seven years ago, and now I still do. So of course I can wait for you. Come back soon, Akira. Hi, I'm Celine, and I've called the St. Augustine Orphanage home since I was six. But I'm not actually an orphan. You see, my parents are special agents with secret identities. Sweetie, if one day someone suspicious asks you about your parents, run for your life. I was used to these fleeting, ghost-like visits from my parents. They often took turns sneaking in and out at night, spending the little time they had with me, and always came together for my birthday. And even though I didn't see them much, they taught me some awesome skills. By the age of 12, I was fluent in five languages, could play a variety of instruments, and do a butterfly kick on anyone who needed it. Despite living a secret life and not seeing my parents as much as I wanted, I still felt lucky that I had them both in my life. It's my 17th birthday, a day I should be super excited about. You see, my parents always visit me together on my birthday, but I've been waiting here for ages and there's no sign of them. This was the first year this had happened. I didn't like it one bit. Something was definitely up. The next day in church, we were singing hymns when I spotted this strange man in the crowd staring at me. My instinct were telling me something was up, so I eavesdropped on him, talking to a nun. That girl with blonde hair. How exactly did her parents pass away? He asked about my parents. That meant my life was in real danger. I fled with all my survival skills right away. What really happened to my parents? Have their identities been revealed? I didn't dare to think about it. So I made sure no one was following me before going to the subway and looking for a baggage locker. This was where I needed to come in a run-for-my-life situation. I waited until nobody was around before I opened it with my key. Inside was some money, a dossier documenting a girl's life from childhood to old age, and a letter. Our darling Celine, we're very sorry that you didn't have the normal childhood you deserved. Please don't ever doubt that we cherish and love you with all of our hearts. If you're reading this, it means our identities have been compromised. We've included the documents for your new identity. Stay strong. We will reunite soon. You're a loving mom and dad. XO. If my parents could arrange all this for me, I believe that they could handle anything and come back to me soon. So here I am, under my new identity, Diane. Australia, here I come. My parents left me just enough money to start a new life here, pay for rent, and tuition fees. How perfectly ordinary. Diane's parents were researchers away in the Arctic. She's from a basic family and attended normal public schools, then worked as an office accountant, did not marry or have children. Everything was boringly safe. The thing is, if I was going to be someone else, then I should at least be someone fun. So I didn't start school. Instead, I created and adopted the identity of 20-year-old Harper and started my first money-making idea, Marriage on Demand. With all I'd learned from my parents, I could make a whole lot of money and at the same time experience how a normal family would look like. Perfect! First, I became a Harvard doctor graduate so this privileged guy's parents would give him his inheritance. Next, a posh aristocrat who saved my client from a dreadful arranged marriage. And then, a sweet-natured girl who helped my client intimidate their seriously mean friends. As soon as my clients achieved their goals, the contract ended and we went our separate ways. Before I knew it, through my Harper alias, I'd married nine guys in just eight months and become eye-wateringly rich. But as it turned out, the cases I took were all abnormal families. This tenth contract would be my final case. Then I'd say goodbye to Harper and attend college as Diane before I lost all faith in ever getting the family of my dreams. But while driving to my rendezvous, I swear that car was following me. It could be my parents or someone dangerous. Only one way to find out. Now I just had to wait. If they were dangerous, I'd drive straight off this cliff, then swim to safety. Then I saw this gormless, grinning guy peer through my window. He held up a temporary girlfriend contract. Hey, I just want to talk. Could he be my 10th client? Either way, he seemed harmless, so I stepped out of the car. I'm Carlton from the courthouse. You've sure been busy, so I've been assigned to investigate you. As far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to marry multiple times, is it? No, only if they're real and not marriage contracts. Carlton, I only have one client left and I'm not marrying him. I'm his temporary girlfriend, which I believe is legal. So, is there any chance you could turn a blind eye this one last time? Legal or not, I strongly advise you to quit this job and do something more morally upright. Just then, a black car pulled over and a man walked straight towards us. Oh no, had they found me?
I'm sorry for getting you into trouble. I turned around, ready to jump, but Carlton suddenly held my hand back. No need for that. My boss won't eat you alive. Besides, I haven't told anyone about the contracts yet. Oh, so this man's his boss from the court? Turns out he and his wife happened to see Carlton on their way to the airport and just came to say hi. Hey, Carl, it doesn't say much if this girl would rather jump into the sea than date you. He looked really awkward and I felt bad for the guy. Without thinking it through, I clung onto his arm and gave him my best adoring look. Actually, we're deeply in love. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but you know Carl. He's just so strict about things like this. You're right. Carl is rather stiff. If you loosened up a bit, you may have been promoted by now. After they left, I explained to Carlton that's what my job is, helping nice guys out of unnecessary trouble. Nothing immoral about it. I was about to leave when he suddenly stopped me. I could see his attitude changed. Please, make a contract with me. I know you could help me improve my communication skills and get me promoted. You can see how desperate I am right now. I wasn't sure. I mean, number 10 was meant to be my last client, but just look at that clueless face. Fine, but in return, you must be an attentive boyfriend, and I want to have dinner with you and your family every evening. Carl looked a bit confused, but he agreed to my demands. Ugh, this was probably my last chance to experience a family life. I have a strict don't-be-wife-two-people-at-the-same-time rule, so I'm meeting my other client to gently turn him down. Celine, is that you? S Celine, he knew my name? OMG, that's Matten, the genius pianist from the orphanage. Oh no, this was terrible. He could blow my cover. I, um, I was adopted and go by Harper now. My adoptive parents turned out to be a letdown. I had to fake my identity so I could work on my own. I understand. It's so hard for orphans like us to survive. Yes, it sure is. Look, Matten, things got pretty difficult for me, so I had to take another job in a hurry. I can't do two jobs at once. I'm sorry I have to cancel our contract. Yeah, about that. I already publicly announced I have a girlfriend just a second ago. Pianist prodigy Matten confirmed he's currently dating someone? Matten, I really can't do this. Just tell me who your client is. I can make a deal with him. I can't be with them both, so I called an emergency meeting for them to plead their cases. An article accused me of inappropriate behavior towards female artists. It's completely false, of course. I need a girlfriend to distract the public and make them see I'm not a jerk. I want this promotion. If you won't help me, I'll expose you publicly. Pfft, like that matters. I'll just take you back to the US. No, I can't go back there, and I don't want any attention from people either. This is what I'm going to do, Carl. I'll be your girlfriend on weekdays and do anything I can to help you get promoted. In Matten, I'll be your girlfriend, well, pretend to be your girlfriend on the weekend. But my face has to stay out of the media, okay? Once this is done, then it's goodbye Harper and hello, trouble-free, simple Diane. All I have to do is play some music while Matten listens and lets the paparazzi snap photos. I've always admired the way you play music. It follows no rules, but that's what makes it so fearless and fun. His comment made me pine for my parents. They were the reason I played like that. They taught me in the dark, told me to flow with the rhythms without any rules. I miss them so much. I must admit I'd always had a crush on you. When this is over, I want to protect you. I want to be your family. This was sweet, but he didn't know that I already had a family. I just needed to be patient. Then eventually, they'll be back. On weekdays, I joined Carlton for lunch at work and helped him talk to his co-workers and grumpy boss. Then in the evening, I went to his house and gave him tips on how to be more charismatic, make people trust and warm up to him. I also taught him how to walk without slouching and politely greet people. Hi, Mr. Chair. You look great today. Oh, Miss Lamp, are you okay? You shouldn't lose more weight. You're already gorgeous. Isn't that too much? I've never talked like this before. You're doing great. Carlton followed all my advice. He might be a bit clumsy, but in a cute, endearing way. Still, what I anticipated most was joining his family for dinner. I'd never experienced the cozy and warm atmosphere of a family dinner before. Who knew Carl was such a great cook? And so sweet. After only one week, Carl now had friends at work and his boss gave him extra responsibilities. Meanwhile, Matten's reputation also made a rebound thanks to articles like, he doesn't want to be around other girls because he's so passionately in love with this amazing muse. A frantic week quickly passed, which ended with Carlton's family celebrating his new position, all thanks to me. I was so moved I almost cried, but noticed Carlton seemed off. Maybe he was bummed out as he knew this was the end of our contract. After dinner, we went for a stroll around the garden. Then he blurted out, Who are you really? I was super surprised. Then he told me that one of his new jobs was to investigate a girl called Diane who entered the country, then vanished. 
I know you're Diane. I can recognize those eyes anywhere. Yes, I'm Diane, but I only faked my identity to earn money. I know you're lying again. It's fine, you've helped me, so I'll help you too. I faked some info to close the case. Thank you, Carl. This means a lot. I knew how important the laws were to him, but he still broke them. For me. I actually quit my job. What do you mean? What about your promotion? You've tried so hard for that. It's okay. I realized I didn't like it so much anyway. I felt terrible that he'd given up his job because of me. But he didn't need me anymore. Our contract had to end, right? Now it's time to end Matten's contract. Then I can go back to being Diane. However, I showed up at the villa to a swarm of reporters. Are you Matten's girlfriend? Please get out of the car. Are you the girl who dates him for dollars, not love? Please show yourself and verify the news. Looks like the news of Matten's girlfriend being a girl who only married for money had leaked. I sat there not knowing what to do. Then I saw Matten coming out of the villa hand in hand with some shiny haired girl. These rumors about my girlfriend are all lies. Amber is a wonderful, kind hearted soul and I couldn't be happier. Oh, I suppose that's pretty smart of him. Finding someone with a nice background was the only way to save his reputation for now. Goodbye, Matten. I wish you well. It seems he couldn't bring himself to ruin his career to protect me the way Carlton did. Now I was free to be Diane and attend this public school my parents wanted me to. Hmm, I was wondering when you'd show up. You're rather popular. A man with a scar has been asking about you. Someone with a scar was looking for Diane? The moment I realized someone was watching me behind the door, my instinct told me to run for my life. I rushed to the window and jumped down, just to catch Carlton peeping at me. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you, so I tracked down Diane. I didn't expect to find you here, but I like you a lot, and there was no time. They saw us together, so I pulled him away. You're driving like crazy, Diane. Who are they? Why are they chasing us? I don't know. All I know is that they're dangerous. He took his phone out to call 911, but I stopped him. No cops. I can't trust anyone but myself, Carl. I'm so sorry for dragging you into this mess. My parents often told me the best way to escape a chase is to jump into the water. However crazy it seems, please trust me. I took a sudden turn and plunged the car straight into the sea. In the water, I unfastened the seatbelt and turned to see Carl already got out of his. He pulled my hand and we swam through the window. The waves drifted us onto a beach, but I had no strength left to move an inch. They're gonna catch us. Celine, sweetie, please wake up. I rubbed my eyes and saw the golden sand, Carlton, and my mom and dad? Am I dead? M mom? No, sweetie, you're very much alive. Turns out the people chasing us were my parents. After 10 years on the job, they finally eliminated the criminal gang and retired. Dad ended up getting the scar, but it's all over now. We could finally be a normal family. You sure made it hard for us to track you down by using a different identity. We should have known our cunning daughter would have created a more challenging life. Like father, like daughter. Huh? You're not Diane? Carlton, my name's Celine. Mom, Dad, this is Carlton, my boyfriend. It was so cute seeing him blush. Then he quickly held his hand out and introduced himself to them. It's lovely to meet you both. I care greatly for your daughter and I always will, no matter how mischievous she is. Turns out it's pretty amazing just being Celine. I started school as myself and so far, so good. I'm living with my kind, talented, and normal parents. We're having the best time together. And I get to date this cute, caring chef. The best part is I can finally stop running for my life and just enjoy the people I love most. I opened the drawer and, ah, uh, there it was. I'd been looking for this magazine for ages. But as I closed the drawer, I noticed something else. A photo hiding under the magazine. There was a woman and two kids in the photo. A boy and a girl. I was so confused. Hmm, who were they? I turned it over and there was a message on the back that said, This is my new number. Call me more often. I miss you so much. Suddenly my mom came in and I was about to ask her about the photo, but she got mad and started screaming at me to get out of the room. Never, ever come into our room again. Do you hear me, Aaron? We have private stuff in here. You know the rules. I, I was just looking for the magazine, I said, and quickly tucked the photo inside before running out of her room. Actually, I knew I wasn't meant to go in my parents' room, but I was doing a school essay on sustainability, and I'd seen an article in my mom's magazine about it a few days back. So I'd searched the whole house to try and find it. 
Eventually, I knew the only place it could be was their room, so I snuck in. Usually, their door was locked, so I was in luck. Ever since I was a kid, I had been forbidden to go in there, but I had no idea why. Back in my room, I couldn't stop staring at the photo. Were these my relatives or something? Long-lost cousins? The boy in the pic looked totally like my dad. Oh, no. Reading the note behind it again, suddenly I thought this could be another family of my dad. Do you know what I meant? Yes. What if my dad had a secret family? Maybe he'd cheated on my mom and had this whole other secret life. My inner detective was going crazy. There was nothing else for it. I had to get to the bottom of this and find out the truth. I searched online for the phone number and couldn't believe it when a girl the same age as me popped up. I started scrolling through all her photos and suddenly saw one of a young guy holding a baby and the caption said, Miss the old days of being daddy's little girl. This was insane. I was certain the young guy in the photo was my dad and I needed to talk to the girl ASAP. I messaged her and told her we were related. I even sent some photos of me taken with my dad to prove it. I was shaking when I saw her reply pop up. My dad never mentioned you. Not even once. That hurt me so much. I couldn't believe this girl was actually my dad's daughter too. Now, how am I supposed to break this news to mom? She'd freak out. I couldn't bear the thought of seeing this crush her. So, I decided to go clear things up myself first. A few days later, my dad was going on a business trip to Boston. Again. He was always going to Boston. I'd always believed he was just super busy at work. But now I knew the truth as my dad's secret daughter had confirmed she was also from Boston. I mean, of course she was. So I told my mom I was going to spend the weekend at my friend's house. And the moment my dad left, I jumped in a cab that I'd called and asked the driver to follow him. When we got to Boston, I saw my dad stop outside of a house and then glance around as if he thought he was about to get caught. Then he got out of his car and rang the doorbell. A woman came to open and immediately they started kissing. Then a young girl appeared and, yep, it was exactly the people in the photo. I was shaking so much, I actually dropped the money for the cab. It felt like my dad had punched me in the chest. I was so upset. He had this whole other family that mom and I had no clue about. I couldn't stand it anymore. Mom didn't deserve this. I walked towards the house and was so focused on what I was planning to say to my dad, I didn't even notice a van pulling up right next to me. Suddenly, everything went black, and I realized I had been blindfolded. A huge hand was covering my mouth so I couldn't even scream. I felt tape being put across my lips, sealing them shut. Then someone yanked me backwards and shoved me into some kind of car. Oh my god, was I being kidnapped? Why? Had my dad seen me and now he was trying to cover his tracks? This was like something out of a movie. They even tied me up. After what felt like a billion hours, we finally stopped and I was dragged out of the car into a cold, dark building. Someone took my blindfold off, but it was so dark inside I couldn't really see anything except a single light bulb above my head. The tape across my mouth was pulled off and I was untied. I wanted to run out of there as fast as possible, but I was terrified. Two men dressed in black were standing in the room and one of them glared at me and said, They think they can hide you forever? (laughs) Who are you? I shouted. Where am I? If it's money you want, call my dad. Please, just let me go, I said, in what must have been the shakiest voice ever. Don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. We don't even need money. It's your parents we want. In three weeks, they'll be out of prison. And then they'll need to come here to get you back. Then we can really punish you for knowing too many secrets about us. I had no idea what they were talking about. Prison? My parents aren't in prison. You've got the wrong person. One of the men just laughed and said, It's been 12 years, and yet you still don't know about it. Then he walked off laughing his head off. What? What were they talking about? None of this made any sense. My dad was a businessman, and my mom was a housewife. This was all some big mix-up. It had to be. They'd locked me in that dark room. 
I tried to scream and bang on the door, but no one heard me. Or if they did, they didn't care. The next few days were some of the worst of my life. I didn't think I'd survive. Twice a day someone slipped food under the door, and I spent most of the time trying to think of ways to escape. There was no window, but there was a small air vent, and if I could just open it, I thought I might be able to crawl through and get the heck out of this disgusting, shabby place. Lucky for me, they'd given me a fork to eat with, and slowly I'd been using it to loosen the screws on the grid of the vent. Finally, on the third night, I waited until everything was dead quiet, and I got into the vent. I crawled through and managed to get out. I was at the back of some old abandoned warehouse, and as I stood up to stretch my legs, someone covered my mouth from behind. Oh, no! How had I got caught so quickly? But then I heard a voice. Shh, are you okay? I almost screamed. It was my mom. How did you find me? I asked. But she just grabbed my hand and said, Let's get out of here. Then I'll explain. We climbed through a small gap in the fence, and then I saw a black car by the road. I started to panic again, but my mom told me it was for us. And then as we climbed in, she said to the driver, I got her, James. Let's go. It was only then that I finally took a look at my mom and realized what she was wearing. She was in all black and looked like a spy or something. Um, Mom, what's going on? My mom bit her lip and said she couldn't hide it from me anymore. What she told me next was unbelievable. Turns out my parents weren't even my real parents. My biological mom and dad used to be members of this mob, but 12 years ago they'd been given an impossible task and they refused to do it, so their boss said he'd harm me as their punishment. My parents had no choice but to turn themselves in and ask the police for protection for me. In return, they gave the police some confidential info about the mob. Whoa, I was shocked. So, you're not my mom? My real parents are in prison? I felt like my head was spinning. How could my life get so crazy? Yep, they're in prison. Back then, the police stormed into the mob's headquarters, but the boss had managed to escape. That's why we put you in the protection program, because we knew he'd come search for you. This was too much. I didn't want such a dramatic life. Then I suddenly remembered there was more drama. Mom, um, I found out Dad was cheating on you, so I followed him here to Boston. Did you follow him too? I mean, how did you find me? This was so weird. My mom didn't look sad at all. She said, actually, he wasn't cheating. That woman and those kids are his family. You see, at the time, he and I were the only two people qualified enough to adopt you, so he actually left his family to fake our family life to protect you. It was all part of the protection program, but he missed his family so much. That's why he went back to see them most weekends. I'm so sorry, Aaron. We didn't expect it to turn out like this. When you didn't come home on Sunday, I used the GPS we set on your phone, and that's how I found you. Okay, my head was spinning even more. Not only were they not my real parents, they weren't even a real couple. This was absolute insanity, and all to protect me? Wow. And as it turns out, it worked out pretty well, because by tracking me, they found the new boss's hideout, and now the police had arrived and he was finally being arrested. As for me and my family, we had to pretend to be a real family, for now. And actually, it wasn't that hard, because I loved them so much, and they'd sacrificed the past 12 years of their life to protect me. I'd be eternally grateful to them, and my biological parents would be out of prison soon, and then I'd be reunited with them. I don't remember anything about them, but they also sacrificed their lives to protect me, so they must be pretty amazing, right? Nina, why are you just my cousin and not my mommy? Claudia peered up at me with curious eyes. I knew where this had come from, as the topic of the week at kindergarten was family. Claudia's innocent words made me squirm with guilt. Was I a bad person? I'd been asking myself this daily for the last four years. Yep, the little girl next to me wasn't my daughter. I stole her from her real dad and have been raising her single-handedly ever since. It all started with my uncle Oliver, who is a successful businessman and a super loving person. I owe a lot to him and to my grandma, as they're the ones who raised me after my parents died in a car crash when I was just a little girl. My uncle had been doing a great job filling up the missing father figure in my life. But he also wanted a biological child of his own, which was quite a tricky problem to an asexual man like him. 
One evening, I just got in from hanging out with my friends, when I saw him sitting at the kitchen table. His head in his hands, I asked, Uncle, what's up? He looked at me with swollen red eyes, sighed, then said, Nina, it's silly, really. It's just my birthday is next month, and I don't have the one thing I want the most in the world. I pulled him into a hug and comforted him. I knew he's still longing for a kid, and I wanted to help him. So, together, we looked into the surrogacy process. My uncle was so excited, and he did all the paperwork to buy a donor egg. Now all he needed was a surrogate mother. So he went through his local surrogacy agency, and they presented him with five potential surrogate profiles. I swear, he must have reread each of them about 100 times. But he eventually chose one. A woman called Kathy. On paper, Kathy sounded perfect. She was a 31-year-old who already had a healthy little boy called Robbie. A contract was drawn up. All Kathy's medical care would be paid for, and she'd also receive a pretty large sum of money. Then, when the baby was one week old, my uncle would raise them alone. This all sounds perfect, huh? Well, it soon took a turn for the worst. Once Kathy fell pregnant, Uncle Oliver wanted to be around her more so he could bond with the baby. One time I walked into the lounge to classical music playing, and my uncle pressing his head to Kathy's belly to see if the baby could hear the music. Soon coming home to find Kathy there became the norm for me. At first I didn't mind as she was always really sweet to me, and we even had small talks from time to time. But then, one morning when I was heading downstairs to go to work, I spotted her standing in the yard helping my grandma water the flowers. I was about to walk over to greet them, then I heard her say, Oliver is such a lovely man, but he's so busy. I worry he'll find it all a bit too much juggling a newborn and work. Then Grandma said, Don't worry, sweetie, as he'll have Nina and me around to help. But Nina is so young, and she has her own life to lead. She's always out at a party or with some boy, and you can't be expected to take care for a baby, not at your age. I just don't want a stranger caring for my baby, not when I could help out. What? Her sweet as sugar behavior was all an act, wasn't it? How dare she try and manipulate my lovely grandma? A few days later, I went down to dinner to see Kathy sitting there. She smiled at me and asked me about my day. I wasn't buying her overly nice act, but I went along with it anyway. At one point, she suddenly took her phone out, then her smile turned into a frown. Oh, no. Robbie has a fever. I better go to him. She immediately pulled back her chair and stood up. You know how it is. Only a mother's love can make a little one feel better. Then she left. Kathy's poisonous words had definitely got to Grandma. As she showed concern for Robbie and let out a gentle smile as her eyes followed Kathy's steps. And that was only the beginning. Kathy's game playing continued as, a few days later, she showed up on our doorstep in tears. Then she came out with some story about how the venue for Robbie's birthday party had canceled, and they refused to refund her. Like clockwork, my uncle told her she could have the party at ours, and that he'd cover the costs. On the day of the party, I saw Kathy pass my uncle all of the receipts for the bouncy castle, magician, catering, etc. She gently pat her tummy and grinned. You'll be such a wonderful father. You know, we could always have another one after this. For free, of course. Then, later on, I saw her whispering something to Robbie. Then the next minute, he ran over to my uncle. He hugged his legs and said, Thank you for the party, Daddy. Then Kathy hurried over to him, ruffled his hair, and said, Oh, honey, he's not your daddy. But it'd be nice, wouldn't it? To all live here together with the baby. Enough was enough. So that night I confronted my uncle and grandma about it. I don't have a good feeling about Kathy. I think she's trying to break the contract. My uncle sighed, then said, I know. Then grandma added, Kathy's right though. Oliver can't do this alone. You're too young and I'm too old. So it makes sense for Kathy to stick around and help. Still better than having some random stranger around, right? I can help out, I raised my voice. Rather me than her. I don't trust her. 
Grandma shook her head. But she's the mother. She's carrying the baby. Their bond is undeniable. I know what it's like to lose people I love. Kathy will break this baby's heart. I'm sure of it. She's only out for herself. My face turned red as I raised my voice. My uncle remained silent. Then he just sighed and walked out of the room. I ran after him and pulled him back. Uncle, you made your choice right from the beginning. Why change it now? He replied with his eyes glued to the ground. Your grandma has a point. What? My voice was up to high pitch. Stop letting that witch Kathy manipulate you. He shook his head, then walked away. Oh my God. They were being controlled like puppets. This needed to stop. So I decided to confront Kathy about it. My chance arrived the next day. She was helping to cook dinner. So I said to her, I know what you're up to. You just want an easy life without any money worries. That's why you're manipulating them. But you can't fool me. She stopped chopping the carrots, then looked at me. Is that so? The thing is, Nina, I always get what I want. She gave me an evil smirk. Then she slammed the knife into the carrot with such ferocity that I flinched. It was official. Kathy was crazy, but I didn't have any proof. So basically, there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. As expected, the craziness continued into the next day. I went to Grandma's room and saw her looking flustered as she searched through her bedside drawer. I, again, couldn't find my pills, and that they kept on showing up in strange places. She seemed really worried that she was losing her mind. Later on, when we were all eating dinner, Kathy went to the fridge, and surprise, surprise, guess what she found there? Yep, Grandma's pills. Obviously, Kathy had put them there. Then she walked over to Grandma, rubbed her shoulder, concernedly said, I should have taken care of you more. We should have you checked by the doctor as soon as possible. Age can be so cruel on the mind, and you don't want to be forgettable around the baby. After that, Grandma seemed totally convinced that she was too old to take care for a baby, even after the doctor told her she was fine. Furthermore, she was adamant that Kathy should move in to help out. Ugh! What a snake Kathy was! A month later, the baby was born. A girl. My uncle named her Claudia, after my mom. We all cried happy tears and welcomed her into our family. Kathy got her wish, and both her and Robbie moved into our house. One morning, I came downstairs to see Kathy holding the baby. In front of her was the ripped-up contract. I told her to leave, and she smirked and said, You're a smart girl, Nina, but you're no match for me. I'm not going anywhere. This is my home now, so get used to it. I knew there was no point telling my uncle and grandma about this. I couldn't let this woman destroy my family. She was dangerous. She could end up hurting everyone. She'd never stop until she got what she wanted, and there's no way I could let that happen. So, when Kathy was in the bathroom, I picked Claudia up, and before I could stop myself, I was fleeing from the house and out of their lives. I moved to a new town and got a new job. It was only meant to be temporary, but I guess I was too selfish and afraid to go back. I'd always been truthful with Claudia about one thing, that I was her cousin, not her mom. So, when Claudia said the words, Nina, why are you just my cousin and not my mommy? I felt so guilty. She was missing out on a relationship with her father because of me. Yes, I'd wanted my family to get out of Kathy's trap, but what I did wasn't fair to my uncle. I knew that now. I had no right taking his daughter away from him for four years. I felt so awful. Thinking about the distress, I must have caused him and Grandma. The guilt was eating me up, and I knew I couldn't carry on like this anymore. So I called up an old family friend and asked him to approach my uncle. Later that day, my friend got back to me with a message from him. Kathy's gone, and she won't be coming back. You were right about her, of course. She was only after my money. After you left, she didn't seem to care about Claudia at all, and she threatened to go to the cops and report you unless I paid her off. Please, just come back to me and Grandma. We sure aren't happy with what you did, but we know you had good intentions. We love you, and we just want our girls back home. Tears streamed down my face, 
They'd found it in their hearts to forgive me. Running away had never been the answer, even if I'd done it with good intentions. It was time to stop running. It was time to go home. So I peered down at the little girl who reminded me so much of my uncle. Claudia? I took her hand. Are you ready to go home to daddy? Yes! Headshot! Go cry to your mama! <laughs> You're probably wondering who this gaming pro is. Well, that's me. Yes, it's 3 a.m., and I've been playing for nine hours straight, but time sure does fly when I'm gaming. I'm Cooper, by the way, and I live with my wife Amelia and our baby girl Ara. I wanted to call her Zelda, but my wife said no way. I love gaming, and always thought it would be there to save me, but instead, it almost cost me everything I love. It started back when I was a little kid. My parents argued a lot. So I used to make a fort in my room, switch on my Nintendo DS, and escape into a virtual world. This love of games continued as I grew up. I didn't socialize or anything. Instead, I rushed home from school and went straight on my Xbox, PlayStation, or PC. I didn't have any real friends. Nope. The only kids I spoke to were ones I gamed with. Then I graduated from college and ended up with a job as a system engineer for a big tech company. Jeez, it was exhausting. By the time I got home, I was so tired I could barely keep my eyes open, let alone game. So, I put my gaming equipment in the basement. But then everything changed when I bumped into Amelia in a local coffee house. Whoa, she was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I guess she must have seen something she liked in this goofball, as after dating six months, we got married. I know, crazy, huh? Soon after, she fell pregnant. I was excited but also terrified. How did that happen? I mean, I know how it actually happened, but whoa. Me? A dad? Then, when Aura was born, my life turned completely upside down. You see, babies cause a lot of stress. Did you know that the quickest way to get a child's attention is to sit down and look comfortable? Because every time I did that, she started to cry. Work sucked, and then my home life sucked too. There was no escape. I felt like I was going to explode. So I went down to the basement and set my PC up. I started playing World of Warcraft. It felt incredible to be a druid again. The thought of gaming kept me going at work. Then when I got home, I barely acknowledged my wife and daughter and rushed down to the basement to play games. Amelia wasn't happy about it. She often appeared with a crying aura and told me to take her. But I just grunted out a, I'm busy, then carried on with my game. Hey, she was the one at home all day while I worked my butt off. All she needed to do was take care of the baby and keep the house clean. Easy. I told her this, and she got mad and made me sleep on the couch. Great. No, I mean really great. I could play video games all night long. <laughs> awesome. But it turns out it's much easier to game all night when you're in high school and can catch some Zs at the back of the class. But not so easy when you have a taxing job. I was on level 100 of exhaustion. So it wasn't surprising that I ended up messing up at work and got fired. Amelia was furious and demanded I apply for other jobs. Nah, I didn't want to. I mean, hello? No more early mornings, no more deadlines, no more cranky boss. It was just me and my beloved games. On one occasion, I was heading toward a record high score when suddenly Amelia appeared and blocked the screen. Babe, you need to move. I jabbed at the game console as I desperately tried to peer around her. No, she shouted at me. What's happened to you, Cooper? You look like Gandalf, only the homeless version. You hadn't taken a bath and shaved for weeks. You're killing me here. Now I'm dead. Thanks a lot. I slammed my fist onto the table. That's it. Get out. She yanked on my arm. I can't take this anymore. Get out. She actually kicked me out of my own home. That crazy woman. I didn't have any friends, so I ended up at my parents' house. This was so humiliating. I told them that it was just Amelia being hormonal, but they said she told them all about my gaming obsession, and it had to stop. They'd signed me up to be some guinea pig for an experimental treatment program in Hawaii. Hey, maybe a beach vacation didn't sound so bad, right? But nope. The island was literally in the middle of nowhere. Where was the hotel? All I saw were tiny huts with grass roofs. What? They couldn't expect me to stay here. This instructor guy called Cole gathered the group on the beach and gave us a rundown of the rules. We'd be camping here for the whole month without any digital devices. We also had to follow a strict diet and exercise plan. Are you kidding me? 
I felt like I'd been sucked into a survival game and the escape button was busted. Everybody else started building their tents side by side. Socializing wasn't really my thing, so I built my tent away from them by the sea. It was hungry work and my stomach was rumbling, so I asked Cole when dinner was ready. He told me it was my job to make a fire. Then he passed me a note with instructions. 1. Gather dry wood. 2. Create a fire structure. 3. Light the fire by using the hand drill method. Okay, sounded easy. Dang it! I've been spinning this for about 20 minutes now. Where's the damn fire? I was about to give up when I suddenly saw something glowing. Oh my god, it worked! But then I felt the sneeze and couldn't hold it. Oh no, there goes the ember! In the end, this one guy pushed me out of the way and lit the fire in a few minutes. What a show off. I was licking my lips in excitement when I saw Cole bringing out some food. But disappointedly, he passed me a plate of veg. What? I shouted out, where's the freaking chicken? Cole pointed at the white thing on my plate. It's chicken breast. No, that's not chicken. Where are the wings and the breadcrumbs? He rolled his eyes. It's called clean eating. Get used to it. This place was a nightmare. But a good night's sleep would make me feel better, right? Wrong, as the ground was as hard as rocks. Finally, I fell asleep, only to wake up with soggy feet. Oh no, my tent was flooded. No wonder nobody else chose to camp next to the ocean. Island routine was awful. It was full of dumb group activities such as meditation, beach soccer, and hiking. One day, we even had to build a raft. As usual, I tried my best to avoid working and socializing, but there's no way they'd leave me alone, so I reluctantly participated. After it was done, we tried it out, but it soon capsized, and I was the only one that couldn't swim. Everyone immediately rushed over and saved me. I was so touched and felt ashamed that I've been so self-centered. So after that, I actually tried to put myself out there and be more sociable. And not gonna lie, it was not too bad. Then our evenings were spent sitting around the campfire and listening to everyone drone on about their problems. My turn was easy for me because I had no problems. The problem was my wife, not me. She didn't understand that I had a lot of pressure at work and home. So playing video games was my only escape. Everyone tutted and glared at me. Then a guy named Brad said, That's not cool, bro. To be honest, I was the same way. I was addicted to watching sports and refused to help my wife out. So we switched places and I learned how hard caring for the kids and looking after the house is. I knew I needed to change before I lost my family forever. So that's why I joined the program. Poor guy, but this wasn't the same for me, was it? I don't know, maybe I had been a little unfair on Amelia. I was thinking about this as I walked back to my tent when this girl named Brittany caught up with me. She put her hand on my shoulder and flicked out her hair. Was she, um, flirting? I waved my wedding ring finger in front of her, but she just shrugged and said, I don't see your wife here. Come to me when you change your mind. Then she walked away. Jeez, this girl was crazy. Kinda hot, but still crazy. The next day I unzipped my tent, ready for another day in this nightmare. But what was this? Huh? It was kind of beautiful here. It was like I was seeing it for the first time. The sparkling sand, swaying palm trees, lush tropical plants, and endless sunshine. Amelia and Aura would love it here too. I hoped they'd both forgive me. I really did miss them. By the end of the month, I didn't want to go home and play games anymore. Instead, I wanted to hug my family and never let them go. The day before we left, Cole rewarded us all with a one-minute phone call. As much as I wanted to hear Amelia's voice, I was kind of nervous. I hoped she wasn't mad at me anymore. The phone started to ring, but some guy picked up. I asked where Amelia was, but he said she was in the shower. Then the line went dead. My one minute was up. Who was that dude? Was she having an affair? We were still married. And we have a child together. Furious, I ran into Brittany's tent, wanting to get back at my cheating wife. Brittany came toward me and was about to kiss me, but I couldn't go through with it. So I dodged out of the way, mumbled out a, uh, sorry, then hurried out of there. The next day, I finally got off the island, and I went straight home to confront Amelia. I opened the door to see a man standing there holding my little Ara. How dare he? I yelled out, get away from my daughter. Suddenly, Amelia appeared. Cooper, stop, it's Rob. I processed this information. Oh, wait, he was Rob, her half-brother. Oops. I'd never met him before as he'd been living abroad. I quickly muttered out an apology to him. <laughs> How embarrassing. I noticed Amelia was giving me this weird look. Then she said, Wow, Cooper, you look so different. Oh yeah, before we were sent home, each of us were treated to a little makeover. 
a new haircut, new clothes, and a shave. And the clean eating and exercise meant I'd lost 20 pounds. Guess Amelia just couldn't resist this new hottie in town. She went straight for one big hug. So, in the end, Amelia forgave me for being a massive jerk. Now I have a new job. It's pretty boring, but I enjoy coming home and spending time with my family. As for gaming, I still do it, but in moderation. Only Tuesdays and Thursdays, but I make sure I switch it off by 10 p.m. Then I go and cuddle my wife. The gaming world is great and all, but I've come to learn that there's something even better in life, and that's making memories in the real world with my girls. The buzzing of my phone woke me up. Ugh, what was this? It's 6 a.m. for Christ's sakes. Go away, I slurred at my phone, trying to reach my arm over to shut it up. The buzzing stopped briefly, but then started up again. So I answered it with a frustrated, yeah. My girlfriend, Nayla, replied. Samuel, my roomies are going away for the night, so hurry over and bring me a big kiss. Well, that sure got my attention. I sat upright and replied, sure, babe, I'll shower, then come right over. Ooh, I love it when you freshen up for me, she giggled. <laughs> Anything for my girl. I was so excited that I whooped and fist-punched the air, then rushed out of bed to go get ready. Oh, how naive and unsuspecting I was. Guys, never in a million years could I have imagined the humiliating situation I was about to step into. Ah, my sweet Nayla, my high school sweetheart and the love of my life. The problem was that we now went to different colleges, but it wasn't just three cities separating us, you see. She lives in a female-only hostel. Yeah, you heard me right. It's female-only, and there are some pretty strict rules in place. The main one being, guys are only allowed to visit on weekdays between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. What a bummer. If this wasn't bad enough, Nayla's two roommates, Phoebe and Luna, were man-hating vultures. Shudder. Phoebe hated men because they'd cheated her out of money not once, but twice. As for Luna, well, I don't really know what her problem with guys was. I think she just likes copying Phoebe. So you see, that's the reason why I never stepped foot in there, not even during visiting hours. But now they were away. I was free to visit my girl without fear of them circling me with their death stares. I showed up smelling of my fave aftershave and with a box of candy. It was so good to spend some time with Nayla, but geez, these visiting hours passed by quickly. Soon 5 p.m. arrived and I had to leave. It was even stormy out and I wasn't looking forward to the trip back. Don't go, Nayla pulled on my arm. I have an idea. Seeing as how my roomies are away, you should stay the night until the next day's curfew. She chewed on her lip. Wow, she was so sexy. She knew I couldn't resist it when she did that lip thing. I hugged her and said, now you're talking. That night we cuddled up on her bed and watched a romantic movie, had some chicken sandwiches and waffle fries. And with the sound of the storm outside as our setting, we French kissed. <laughs> a lot. Talk about paradise. But then her phone buzzed. She checked the message. Her eyes full of panic. Then she said, Samuel, this is bad. The storm means that Phoebe and Luna are ending their trip early. They're on their way back. I knew that if anyone caught me here, they'd probably throw Nayla out. I couldn't let that happen to my girl. But escaping the hostel wouldn't be easy. She opened the door to check. The problem was her door opened up into the shared living room. And there were some girls hanging out in there. Ugh. What was I meant to do now? We were four stories up, so I couldn't exactly climb out of the window. And it's not like I could dig my way out. Nayla started pacing the room. Then she opened her wardrobe up and tried making space for me in there. Heck no! Confined spaces weren't my thing. But thankfully, just then, she shook her head and muttered to herself, That's no good. The others use it too. She quickly changed her mind. Then grinning at me, she said, I know. Let's turn you into a girl. Immediately, she pulled out from the wardrobe this long wig we used last Halloween. Putting the thing on my head, she continued, Almost? Hmm, I know, you need makeup. Then she started slathering this powdery stuff on my face. Oh dear, the madness has begun. I was so stunned, I just sat there and let her make me up like I was a doll. The wig was so itchy, and it kept on sticking to my lip gloss and stuff, and I couldn't even see properly through the fake eyelashes she stuck on. After finishing, she stepped back to look at her finished masterpiece. Then she burst out laughing. I looked in the mirror. Even through my sticky eyelash vision, I could tell that I looked ridiculous. Seriously, I was more a clown than a girl. She threw an oversized dress at me and said, Hmm, I don't have anything else that'll fit you. I reluctantly got changed, and then I noticed that she was staring at my legs. I looked at them too. Jeez, they were gorilla-level hairy. Ah, uh, don't worry, I'll sort those out for you. The next thing I knew, she was positioning me down on her desk chair, and then passed me a towel. In case of emergency. Then she started preparing the wax strips. What could be so bad about a little bit of wax, huh? Then she ripped it off. Oh, good God, the pain. I began to perspire and bit down on the towel to block out my screams. Why did girls put themselves through this torturous activity? No thanks, I'd rather be hairy. 
The last wax strip was the worst, and my screams escaped out of the towel. Oops! I immediately jumped on the bed, facing the wall, and pulled a blanket over my head while Nayla tried to put away all the makeup and stuff as fast as possible. The girls in the living room for sure had heard me and rushed inside. Behind them were Phoebe and Luna, who just got home. What's with the screaming, and who is she? Phoebe pointed at me. Um, I thought I saw a spider, but it was just a clump of hair. And this is Sam, uh, Samantha. She's my friend, but she's come down with a fever, and she's gonna have to stay over. Suddenly, the blanket was pulled out, and a hand came towards my forehead. My heart stopped beating for a second. Then Luna said, Yup, she's on fire. Let's leave her to rest. Phew, that was a close one. Turns out the waxing session had heated me up so badly that I ended up drenched in sweat. So I could totally pass for being ill. Luckily, after that, the other girls left the room to give me some space. Nayla cuddled up to me and whispered, You're doing great. We need to keep this up till morning. Then you can leave when the boys are allowed here. I gave a meek nod. I was too afraid to talk in case someone heard me. This was bad. But I guess all this drama wiped me out as I managed to fall asleep. I awoke to someone pounding my shoulder. Hey, you're snoring like a grunting pig! Nayla hissed at me. After that, I lay there wide-eyed and terrified. I didn't dare fall back to sleep. It was going to be a long night. The minutes went by so slowly, but then, oh no, Mother Nature called. I tried crossing my legs, but it didn't help. All I could think about was the beach and a waterfall, and oh, I had to go to the bathroom right now. The room was dead quiet, so the other girls must be sleeping, right? I tiptoed through the room, then to the living room. Not familiar with the house, I had to use my hands to guide myself. Then suddenly, I accidentally touched something soft. While my brain was trying to work out what it was, I felt a slap across my face. Then a girl said, Hey, what are you doing? Horrified, I tried to squeak out a, Sorry, with the girliest voice I could, then hurried off to find the bathroom. But that was not all. While I was in there, the door suddenly opened, and a girl saw me peeing while standing up. Damn it, I should have locked the door. Then she yelled out, What on earth is this? I finished what I was doing. Then turned around to try to explain, but the girl looked so terrified as she pointed at me and stuttered. Ghost! Ghost! Oh right, my wig was hanging down over my face, so I probably looked like that spooky girl from the ring. I froze there, not sure what I should do next, when the other girls gathered around me. Luckily, my babe ran over and put her arm around my waist and said, Sorry girls, my friend often sleepwalks, and combined with the fever, well, uh, it's made her delirious. Then she quickly pulled me back to her room and everyone dispersed. Phew! That was a close call. After that, I lay in bed too afraid to cough, flinch, and basically breathe. It was the longest and most tiring night of my life. Finally, morning arrived. This ordeal would end soon, right? Wrong! Phoebe and Luna wouldn't leave the room at all. What was going on? Didn't they have lives to lead? In the end, Nayla asked them, You two don't have classes today, huh? They must have shaken their heads or something, and then she said, Oh, okay. Um, there's a new clothes shop open in the mall. Want to check it out? Without responding, Phoebe sprang to her feet, walked over to me, pulled back the blanket, and tugged at my wig. Then, with a massive smirk on her face, said, Game over, Samantha! Shocked, me and Nayla tried muttering out explanations, but Phoebe rolled her eyes. Quit it. I can recognize a man from a mile away. Besides, his boots are under your bed. Then there's his aftershave. It stinks! She waved her hand in front of her face. Well, you fooled me! Luna stared at me. Actually, your makeup's pretty good. Huh, but not me, Phoebe sneered. I only kept quiet because I don't want to get Nayla kicked out. That, and it was kind of funny watching you both try to keep up the pretense. She glared at me. But I suggest you leave before I change my mind. I headed toward the door, but then Nayla said, Um, babe, you may want to change first. Oops. In all the drama, I'd forgotten I was still dressed up as a girl. She handed me some face wipes so I could remove the makeup. Then I changed back into my clothes, muttered out an apology to her roomies, then hurried out of there. So, this happened a while ago, but just thinking about it still makes me cringe. Oh, the shame. I haven't seen Luna and Phoebe since, and I don't think I'll ever be able to look them in the eye again. One good thing to come out of it, that Nayla and me are now stronger than ever. The things we do for love, huh? So that's it, the most cringeworthy episode of my life. Yep, I know, it's so humiliating. So what about you? How bad is yours?